السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد أحباب المصطفى عليه الصلاة والسلام what a wonderful occasion to be in the house of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and for those of you who are joining at home a wonderful time to be sitting in the comfort of your own home as we spend the next few moments reflecting on the life of our beloved messenger Muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam. Who knows the dates in the Hijri calendar today? I didn't come prepared to give mm -hmm. you guys any prizes, although I have lots of questions. I'm trying to think. No? Nope. The brother is checking his calendar on Google and still getting it wrong. Wow. Uh, no, maybe it's the 10th for some people. I'm not sure. But uh, my calendar told me it was the 11th of Rabi'a al -Awwal. But maybe some people cited the moon late. You know, this issue we have in Ramadan always, but we never think about it outside of Ramadan. 10th <laughs> is valid. 10th or 11th of Rabi'a al-Awwal, regardless, the important thing is that we are in the month that most of the historians agree the Prophet ﷺ was born, right? And obviously, of course, this is a monumental moment in the event of humanity. That the Rasul ﷺ was born and so began the last chapter of life on this earth. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he taught us ﷺ that his coming is from the signs of the Day of Judgment. And his death is also from the signs of the Day of Judgment. That's why when some people start panicking and saying all the signs of the Day of Judgment are here, we tell them this is nothing new. It's been here for a while. The Prophet ﷺ coming and living in this world was a sign of the Day of Judgment, والسلام. And so the Prophet ﷺ was born in this blessed month of Rabi' al-Awwal. Many scholars say on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, which according to my calendar is tomorrow. But there are others who dispute the date the Prophet ﷺ, you know, himself, when he was born, this is something to understand for all of us, that the Arab society of Jahiliya was not a society that was accustomed to keeping dates. They didn't have a calendar, right? And this is why in our Islamic history, there is a huge moment in our history where Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab introduced the Hijri calendar. Some of you may have heard this. But in the Khilafah of Sayyidina Umar, as the Ummah was expanding and the bureaucracy and the government affairs of the Islamic State was growing, he felt like we need a way to track dates. We have to have a calendar. This calendar has to start somewhere and we continue from there. And so Sayyidina Umar, after consulting with the Sahaba, the decision was made that the Hijra will be year one of our Islamic calendar. But I want you just to understand and imagine that before that, the Arab didn't have their own calendar and they didn't have something to mark dates by. And this is why when we say that the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ, his exact date of birth is unknown, don't think this is some mystery. It's because of the environment and the condition of that society. So even, I'll give you guys an example. Um, which year was the Prophet ﷺ born in? Who knows? The year of the elephant, right? So this is a good indication to show you how the Arab used to think. They didn't have a number for the year. They said the year that the elephant came. That's how they tracked the times, right? And then imagine if something happened two years later, they'll say two years after the elephant came. If something happened three, four years before, they'll say three, four years before the elephant came. And so they didn't have their own calendar. They used to measure time based on significant events. al muhim the Rasul and his memory is essential to each and every single one of us. Prophet Muhammad sacrificed his entire life so that me and you can be guided to the straight path, isn't it? What did the Rasul achieve in his life from a financial perspective, from a material perspective? Like, what did he gain after all the struggle that he endured? 
He gained nothing other than to ensure that the religion of Islam will survive and will be taught one generation to the next, from one civilization to the next, until today, alhamdulillah, Islam has reached with us to the boonies of Halton Hills. Right? This was the life of the Rasul, alayhi salatu wasalam, and this is why, you know, he deserves fully that me and you not only spend one day of the year to think about him and to reflect on his life, but rather it should be part of the, you know, life of the Muslim, the Muslim family especially. Inshallah, here in the message we'll try to do our part when the time comes. But everyone should be very familiar with the biography and the life of Prophet Muhammad for the simple reason that this is somebody who loved us he cared about us right there was one famous incident it's narrated in the authentic hadith that the prophet ﷺ said i wish to meet my friends and his companions i want you to imagine that he's in the masjid maybe and Sayyidina abu Bakr and umar and uthman and the other sahaba are sitting with him and the prophet ﷺ is talking about his friends who he will meet one day he hasn't met them yet and they looked at him and they said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, we are your friends. Like, who are you talking about? And the Prophet ﷺ said, No, you are my companions. You are with me. You live with me. We, you know, believe together. We sacrifice together. We do everything together. You are my companions. But he said, My friends and the ones who are beloved to me are the ones who will come much after me, who would have never seen me, but they will believe in me. I wish to meet them. And inshallah, we hope and pray and we beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all the privileged opportunity to meet with Rasulullah sallallahu on the day of judgment so that we can follow him with his ummah into Jannah inshallah. Then this is how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa thought of me and you as people who are beloved and dear to him. Why? Because we believe in him without having ever seen him. Then if the Prophet sallallahu loved us so much and he cared about us so much, what is expected of me and you is what? That at least we know about his life. And to be completely honest, we know everything about his life. We should know from the beginning of his life, from his childhood, all the way till the moments that he died, alayhi salatu wasalam. And that doesn't mean that you have to become a scholar. Before I get into what I actually want to share with you guys today. It doesn't mean you have to be a scholar. I'm not expecting all of us to go pick up the encyclopedias of the seerah and start studying and taking notes. No. They are very, you know, easy options available to us. Find one of the imma or the ulama online who taught the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. There are some of them, you know, they might be in 30 episodes, 20 episodes, 50 episodes. Some of them are an hour long each, half an hour long each. They're available on YouTube. If you don't know what to find, ask me, I'll share with you, right? Go and find one of these series and make it a point with your family, you know, maybe dedicate one evening during the week, Friday evening, Sunday evening, don't do Saturday evening, Saturday evening we're here, right? So we don't need any of you guys to disappear. Saturday evening we're here, but pick another time, inshallah, that works for you. And start with something digestible, half an hour of some seerah content every week. By the way, this is the way to go. We sit here and look at the ceiling and say, yeah, seerah is so good. I wish I knew the seerah, how you will learn the seerah. It's not going to come from the heavens. Right, but a little half an hour every weekend of consuming some information about the life of the Prophet ﷺ, starting from his birth, I can guarantee you, maybe in one year, we'll sit here next year in the season of the Mawlid to talk about something else, and you guys will know the whole life of the Prophet. ﷺ. We'll say we went from beginning all the way to the end, and we experience it as if we were there to live with the Prophet. ﷺ. And again, you know, there are different depths or different levels of study of the seerah. Some shuyukh have went very much in depth and covered all the details. Some other ones covered it at a surface level, which is good for beginners, good for us to digest as a starting point. But the life of the Prophet is something that every Muslim must be directly attached to, right? Not superficially attached to. Just like this Quran, our deen for us to be Muslim requires a couple of things. It requires number one, that we know Allah and we are connected to his book. This is our connection to Allah, right? And secondly, it requires that we know his messenger, our beloved guide in this life, Sayyidina Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, 
and we have some attachment to his life through his study of or through our study of his seerah. This is absolutely necessary for every Muslim without any exception, without any, you know, there's nobody who can be spared here. Every Muslim has to have some connection with the Quran to increase their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every Muslim has to have some attachment to the study of a seerah to increase their love and affection towards Rasulullah Wasallam. So it's not only today when we do this kind of activity. Today is a good day to start the conversation. But tomorrow and the day after, next week and the week after, the following months that are coming, that's when the real work has to happen. And inshallah it will happen. And I'm telling you, like honestly, we could do it over here in the masjid and we will do it here in the masjid one day. But not everything will be done in the masjid, as you guys can all you know, attest to. You can't do everything. Then the important thing, and I'm hoping, inshallah, this can be something that those of you who are here with me and those who are watching at home, take it and implement in your life. That in your home, the study of the life of the Prophet is something that is constant. Do it for a year and come back to me, tell me you're done, and we'll find something else to do, inshallah, together. Fine. For the purpose of today's discussion, there are a couple of things that I wanted to share with you guys um, as an extension of this introduction that I made. What are some of the benefits or some of the reasons why we study the life of the Prophet ﷺ? First and foremost is, uh, we don't need any bigger incentive than this, it's an act of ibadah. It is worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get to know and to connect with his messenger alayhi salatu was salam you get reward for every minute that you spend learning about the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Every piece of information that is new that you know about your messenger, Allah will reward you for it. That's number one. Number two is the obvious one, which I have been pushing so far, which is it will increase your love of the Prophet ﷺ. The more you know about him, the more you will love him. This is true for every relationship in life, isn't it? Uh, I don't want to pick on anybody, but you know we have people that we look up to in this world, right? They could be athletes, celebrities, whatever the story is. You cannot admire an athlete if you know absolutely nothing about him. Let me give you the factual information, just so we don't rely on any of your fantasies. It is an established fact, unanimously, without any shadow of a doubt, that the best player to ever play the game of football otherwise known as soccer, is Ronaldo. And if there are many, any Messi fans here or watching at home, you can grab a pillow and cry. Now, there is no way that I reach that level of conviction and that level of attachment. Like I don't support and buy into the argument that Ronaldo is the best unless I know a lot about him. I know when he started playing. I know where he plays now, where he played before. I know how many goals he scored. I know how many championships he's won. I know how many appearances he's made for his national team. I know even by competition, his statistics, how many goals he scored in the Champions League, how many goals he scored for his national team, how many goals he scored in the Premier League. I have all of this information about him. I know how many kids he has, maybe not exactly, but the little guy who's growing up to look like him, I know a little bit about him. Then after knowing all of the stuff about him, I am attached and convinced that this is my favorite soccer player and the best to ever play the game. Now, with the Messenger Ali Salatu Wasalam, Taban, he is the greatest human being to ever walk the face of planet Earth. But the same concept applies. Like, how are we going to develop genuine love of the Prophet? Is it by me telling you? Is it by your mom telling you, your dad telling you? Like you're, someone is going to tell you, love Muhammad, and you will say, yes, for sure, definitely. No, it doesn't work like that. The more you know about Muhammad, وسلم, you know about his birth, you know about his death, you know about his children, you know about his wives, you know about his family, you know about his struggle, you know about his leadership, you know about his travel. The more you know about him, eventually you will start to love him. So our study of the seerah from the objectives of it is that it will increase our love of the Prophet. وسلم. One of the lessons from or one of the benefits of studying the seerah for all of us is inshallah we will learn practical lessons for the world that we live in today the prophet muhammad وسلم, the beauty about his life is he lived in this world he had family he had children 
he lived you know with his family he had relatives he had a community he had challenges some of his relatives died some of his friends died he had moments to celebrate then his life Ali والسلام, when you study it you will learn lots of things about how you as a human being can function and operate right we learn from the Prophet وسلم, as men how to be a good husband we learn from the Prophet وسلم, how to have good akhlaq and good character we learn from the Prophet وسلم, how to be considerate of others by the way whether you are a man or a woman when you see the Prophet وسلم, and his emotional intelligence how he thought about other people you will be mind boggled you will be amazed. Today there's textbooks that teach this kind of stuff. But the Prophet Sallallahu this is how he was because of the guidance that Allah provided to him. So from studying the life of the Prophet Sallallahu we will take practical lessons that we can implement in our own lives. And for the purpose of my discussion with you guys today, the fourth and final reason, there's obviously way more, but the fourth reason for today is that the seerah is absolutely necessary for me and you to study because it gives us hope. In the world that we live in today, the condition of the Ummah of Islam, the situation of our brothers and sisters in many different parts of the world, right? I don't have to go down the list, but if we just start, our brothers and sisters in Palestine are still being oppressed and the genocide continues almost one year from the date it started, right? Almost one year, we're two, two weeks out from it being one year. And if you start thinking about it, you realize that a very difficult very terrible situation that the ummah is in then if you scroll a little bit more on your phone you will realize and you will find the story of our brothers and sisters in sudan and the tyranny that has been inflicted upon them by some goons in their own country and their greed for power and how millions of people over there are starving and tens of millions have been displaced it's a disaster and they're all muslim by the way the irony of ironies is in some of these zones within our ummah, the, the warring parties are both Muslim. Sudan is one example of that. Two generals on either side tearing the country apart fully, both are Muslim. right? And if you move past that, you realize that, hold on a second, there's other parts of our ummah that are still under occupation. We are zoomed in now, it's been front and center of the news. The condition of our brothers and sisters in Palestine, but we didn't forget we have a whole pocket of the Ummah in Kashmir. They still live under occupation and they still don't have their freedom and they're struggling for that. You go a little bit further and you look, you find out that, hold on a second, our Muslim brothers and sisters in Syria still haven't gotten their justice and still are living with the aftermath and the effects of a brutal dictator who burnt the whole country almost literally. All right. Then you look at the condition of the Ummah of Islam and you feel like, wow, where are we going from here? And this is why the study of the seerah is essential. Because when you study the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, you will be filled with hope. The Prophet ﷺ faced challenges and he faced obstacles where you couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. The persecution that they faced in Mecca, the expulsion of the Muslims out of Mecca, which is an incident in history where the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, the year of the boycott, they were kicked out of Mecca and they were living in the valley outside of Mecca. And they used to eat, Salamu Alaikum. Welcome back, Shaykh. May Allah bless you. They used to eat, they didn't have food. The people of Quraysh, they signed the agreement to boycott Muhammad ﷺ and the Muslims. And the agreement was nobody will marry from them and we will not allow them to marry from us. Nobody will buy anything from them, and we will not allow them to buy anything from us. Boycott, embargo type of condition, or what we call today commonly sanctions, right? Then the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims were kicked out of Mecca, and they began living, as I said, in the valleys between the mountains outside of Mecca. And they didn't have any food, they didn't have any provision. This, I'm telling you, this is the condition. When you study the seerah, you will see and you will start to live with the Prophet ﷺ in that time and in that condition. And the companions, they report that we didn't have anything to eat. And I want you to imagine, it's not that they were living somewhere where they were growing oranges and pears. 
they were in the valley in the middle of the mountain. So what did they eat? They said there were some greens that used to grow on the earth, not fruits, not vegetables, some kind of leaf, some weed or grass, I don't know what you call it, that was very rough. They would soak it in water and that's what they would eat. And that was their food for you know, a long part of a year until eventually a miracle happened and they were able to return inside of Mecca. That's a whole topic for another day. But that's an entire year of the seerah. I tried to summarize in three minutes, but you need to study in a lot more detail. When you read stuff like that and you study and you connect with what happened to the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, you realize that, oh my God, this seemed hopeless. Where were they going to go from here? But the more you read and the more you study, you'll be full of hope. I want you to think with me, the Prophet ﷺ, his life as a messenger was 23 years. Right? From peak oppression and peak struggle, which was when he made hijrah to leave Mecca. He came back and he liberated Mecca. He had the upper hand within 10 years. It goes to show you what, and that's why the study of the seerah is so important for us. There is hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never abandon the believers. Allah will support the believers. Victory is coming. Victory is guaranteed by the order of Allah. If not today, tomorrow, if not tomorrow, next year. If not next year, in the next decade. If not in the next decade, maybe in our children's lifetime. But it is coming. But at least we need to have hope. And that's why the study of the seerah is so important. There is no benefit to an ummah of Islam that is full of hopelessness. As dark as the situation is, as challenging as the reality is, as difficult as it is to imagine light at the end of the tunnel, we must study the seerah and realize that there is hope and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give victory to the Muslims. Ahbab, to conclude today's discussion, I want to share with you one story from the life of the Prophet Right? By now you understand clearly, we are aiming inshallah to pray Asr at 5.30 as promised. But by now I hope you understand clearly that one halaqa, one event in the masjid will not enable us to cover the sirah. This cannot happen. And I am not even going to try. Right? Last year, if I remember correctly, we spoke about the physical characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ, how he looked, alayhi salatu wasalam. Then imagine if every year that we dedicate one day to study the seerah, this will take, I will die and we will not even reach half of the seerah. And somebody else will come and they will die and they will not finish the seerah. So one day is not going to help us to study the seerah. But one day serves as a reminder, inshallah, for all of us of our need to study the seerah. That's what I hope we can get out of today. But in the spirit of the life of the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, and his, you know, overwhelming value and contribution to this planet of ours, I want to take a moment to reflect on a story, an incident that the Prophet ﷺ had in his life, just to show us the level of his akhlaq and the level of his character, how compassionate he was, how caring he was, and how selfless he was. You know, the problem many times in the world is... I see myself as the most important thing, or you see yourself as the most important thing. And when you have that level of being self-centered and prioritizing yourself over everything else, it becomes very hard to navigate the world around you because you can't think properly, you can't make right decisions. The Prophet ﷺ, you know, he was not a person who was arrogant or who was so worried about himself and so concerned with his own self, he was concerned with being a good person. And so there is this story where the Prophet ﷺ, what is it? there is this story where the Prophet ﷺ, he met a elderly lady, right? And he gave the elderly lady, she was living by herself in a tent, he gave her a hand to carry some of her luggage or some of her belongings and to unload it and carry it into her tent. Old lady, on her own, maybe she would have done it, but she would have really struggled. Then the Prophet ﷺ provided relief and help to her. He saw this old lady, you know, in her he saw maybe his mom or his own relative. Then he couldn't just ignore her and leave her to carry everything herself. 
He went and gave her a hand, took everything inside. The lady was very appreciative and very happy with the help that the Prophet ﷺ provided. That when he finished with his work, she told him, she said, my son, thank you so much for your help. I have nothing by which I can pay. I don't have any money or any valuables that I can compensate you with. But I can give you a good advice that if you follow it, it will be good for you. So Again, the lady, the Prophet ﷺ helped her. Now she wants to repay him. She's saying, I don't have any money, but I'll give you valuable advice. If you follow it, it will be good for you. The Prophet ﷺ humbly listened and he said, please share with me whatever advice you have. The lady said, my son, there is a man, his name is Muhammad. He is very evil. Make sure he doesn't fool you and convince you to follow him. What just happened here? An old lady outside Mecca, she doesn't know much. She heard the news that there is a guy, Muhammad, he came with a new religion. He's splitting the families. People are converting. Lots of chaos. Many people are being oppressed because they changed their religion, blah, blah, blah. She got the news secondhand. Now she is dealing with our beloved Nabi Ali Salam, who just helped her to unload her stuff. And she's saying that my only advice to you, the genuine good advice I have for you, is if you come across Muhammad, don't listen to him. Because he's very dangerous, very bad. And don't let him fool you. So make sure you don't even listen to what he has to say. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? Did he start jumping up and down? You know, did it go into his mind, how could the people think of me like this? They don't know what I do. They don't know who I am. They don't know what I did. How did she make assumptions about me? And I just helped her. The Prophet ﷺ, he smiled at her and he said, I am the Muhammad that they're speaking about. The bad guy, that evil person that they're complaining about, that's me. And the lady was shocked. She was taken aback. And she provided us, by the way, in our tradition with a very nice, detailed description of the Prophet ﷺ. She met him once, I would assume. But she was so moved by his action and by his contribution to her life that she remembered even what he looked like, that she could explain later on that this is what Muhammad looked like. Such was the character of the Prophet ﷺ, his willingness to help, his you know, selfless ability to help those who are in need and to simply say, I am Muhammad, no hard feelings, and he walked away. What can we implement from the seerah in our life today as we close? What can we take from the life of the Prophet ﷺ that we can implement? Learning about the life of the Prophet ﷺ is something you will all do at home, inshallah. But as a jama'ah, as a community here at Masjid Istiqlal, what can we take from the seerah that we will implement and we will bring to reality in our life? I am suggesting, inshallah, one thing, and let's work on this together. I need all of your help. Let's learn from the Prophet ﷺ that art and that goodness of building community. The Prophet ﷺ one of his biggest achievements as a leader was to bring people from Mecca to people of Medina. They were Arab from Mecca, Arab of Medina, and they were Christians and Jews in Medina as well. And he brought them all together under one umbrella and he built a community. Obviously, you don't need to explain, he built a state, right? And he was the leader of that state. They had a government, etc., etc. But before there was a powerful state in Medina, what the Prophet ﷺ did was rather simple. And I want you to think with me about it. It wasn't rocket science. And it's not rocket science for us today either. It just takes having the mindset and having the commitment. The Prophet ﷺ was committed to building community. And he found partners with him that were committed to building community. So they did it. The Prophet ﷺ merely provided a line of thinking, a little piece of guidance to encourage them to form the community. What was that guidance that the Prophet ﷺ offered? The Prophet ﷺ said, give salam to everyone, get to know everyone, right? Meet the people, you see new faces, say salam, get to know who they are. 
whether they look like you, don't look like you, from the same country as you, from different country than you, get to know the people. And then the Prophet ﷺ made his famous statement where he said, share food with everyone. Right? And he promised his community that if they can do this, if they can give salam to everyone, he put a third condition, I'll share it with you for the sake of sharing the knowledge. If you can give salam to everyone, if you can feed and share food with everyone, and if you can pray at night, you will enter into Jannah. That was the conclusion of the Prophet ﷺ. He came to Medina, this is what he told the people. Say salam to everyone, share food with everyone, pray at night, my promise to you, you go to Jannah. This was the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ, that he was able to build a community in Medina. Now, Taban, obviously, we know that the Prophet ﷺ, to build his community, he first established the masjid. He made sure the masjid was the center, was the hub, was the place where this community can revolve around. And he built the masjid. And alhamdulillah, today we have the beautiful masjid. What we need to commit to, inshallah, is to building community. To growing community, right? And this is something that I'm hoping, inshallah, we can take as a lesson in this season of the Mawlid, in this beautiful year that we are living together with or living together in. By the time we meet next year, inshallah, in the season of the Mawlid, I am hoping that we can reflect and say we spent one year building community. Because it's so important, right? The masjid, the value of the masjid, the value of this building or any building really that is a community center or a masjid is not in the carpet or in the walls or in the chandelier or in the mic system. The value is in the people that come to the building. The value is in the community, right? The value is in how we deal with each other. The value is how we welcome new people. The value is how we share food with everyone who comes to us. The value is how we pray and worship Allah in this place, which... I can't do myself, you can't do yourself. We need each other. Like imagine in the month of Ramadan, we want to pray Taraweeh, we have just the Imam. Can this be something that is special that we brag about? No. Can it be that we have a couple of Musallin only, two, three guys and no Imam also? It doesn't work. Then we need Imam, we need administration, we need the management, we need the Jama'ah, we need the locals, we need the guys who get a visa and come from Scarborough all the way across. Right? We need everyone. But what is happening, the first thing that we need to remind ourselves and share with others is we need to have the need in ourselves. Like you need to feel the need. I need to be part of the community. Without that feeling of need, my lecture or anybody else's lecture is going to be of no benefit to you. Right? You need to feel the need that I need to belong. I need to be part of the community. And once I belong and I'm part of it, I need to put my hand to help grow this community, right? It is a religious mandate. It is a religious duty. It's not something I'm saying for the fun of it. I'm not encouraging us here in the next year ahead to build community so we can have a big social club. Trust me, that's not where I'm going. It is a mandate that we have Islamically from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from His Messenger that if we want to practice our deen to its fullest, we need community, right? And community is, I repeat, and you will hear me repeating this a lot going forward, community is not a building. Even if we remove this building, but all of you remained here or somewhere else, we would have community. The community is not brick and carpet. The community is the human capital, the human investment. It's mothers and fathers. It's children, it's imams and khatibs, it's leaders of the organization, it's men and women. This is the investment and this is the capital that we have as a community that we have to work with. The building can come, the building can go, it doesn't matter. Allah and His Messenger didn't send me and you to build the building. Muhammad didn't teach us which color to paint, but He did teach us how to build community. That's what I'm trying to say. Then, I'm hoping, inshallah, that what we take from this season of the Mawlid in this blessed year is that need for the community. That each and every single one of you here feel it in your heart and teach your family, teach your children, teach your spouses that we need to be part of the community. We need to be attached to the masjid. And then share with your relatives, share with your friends, 
we will work together, find ways to invite people, find ways to engage with people, right? You guys, mashallah, those who are watching at home as well, mashallah, are the good people, the special people that form the core of the community. Then as long as we have a good core that feel the need to belong, we are here to work together. We can do anything that we need to do. If you tell me that, you know, opening the masjid instead of halaqa after asr, we need halaqa after fajr. We can do halaqa after fajr if it will bring the people. You tell me dinner on Saturday is not a good idea. We'll do breakfast on Saturday instead. All ideas are, you know, entertained and we can discuss what works best to keep community engaged. But at the very fundamental foundational level, I need you guys and all of you who are at home to buy into the idea that we need the community. We need to belong to the community and we must grow the community. And this community, by the way, as I said, and I'll close with this, is not for the purpose of having social club. It's to ensure that we can practice Islam. Me and you, even as adults, without community, how much Islam can we practice? How much will we practice? The bare minimum. By the time you look at, I don't have kids yet. By the time you guys think about your children, if we don't build the community, you think your children will have anything to anchor them and attach them to Islam? It will be very hard. That's the least I can say. Right? So when we build community and we strengthen the community, there's lots of benefits. It makes the job and it makes the burden on each and every single one of us a lot lighter to carry. When the community is built and developed, you don't have to worry about your kid wanting to come to the masjid or not. Because he or she will have many friends that they come to the masjid with. They'll come willingly. They'll start telling you, mom, we need to go to the masjid. Dad, you have to stop what you're doing today because my friends are going to the message. I need to go there to see them, right? That is possible. We can reach that level. But the community has to be strengthened. And it has to be our priority, not only to have a building, but to have a community that inhabits the building, inshallah. I think I have emphasized and did my best to drive my point home. And I hope and pray, inshallah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a tawfiq to be able to not only occupy and inhabit his house, but also to build a community that belongs to his house in the hope, inshallah, that it will help all of us to live and die as Muslims, not only ourselves, but us and our children and their children and their children until the end of time. Ahbab, today's program, inshallah, will wrap up with a Quranic recitation from Rizqa, followed by the translation. Zoya will share the translation of the ayat, inshallah. And then we will make adhan for Salatul Asr. And then we will pray Salatul Asr. And then I have a couple of questions for you guys. We'll do a quick little quiz together. Question? Question? We'll take questions shortly. And after the quiz, inshallah, we have dinner for everyone who was here from the beginning of the halaqa. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking. There's dinner for everyone, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. Question? The Prophet said, uh, Especially when we left Salah. May Allah bless you. The Prophet said, Afshu salam wa at'im al ta'am wa sallu bil layli wa nasu niyam tadkhuluna al jannata bi salam. Alayhi salam. Welcome back, man. Good to see you. The Prophet said, Give salam to everyone, share food with everyone, pray at night, you will enter into Jannah in peace. That's Islam for you. That's building the community for you. Taban, pray during the day as well. Don't skip Dhuhr and Asr because you only pray at night. Pray during the day as well. But the point is for everyone who just joined us, I think the brother was hoping that I can re reiterate the message so everyone can get it. The point is we said that this year, in this blessed season of the Mawlid, the lesson that we are taking with us, and we have one year to work on it, is what? That we are going to belong and strengthen and contribute to building the community. Because this is what the Prophet ﷺ was about. His mission والسلام, was to build community, right? And he succeeded. And inshallah, we will succeed as well. And the way to build community, we said, is not hard. That's what the brother was asking me to share with you guys. Say salam to everyone. Welcome everyone. Get to know everyone. Share food with everyone, right? Our practice and our habit of having dinner together 
eating together is very healthy from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And it is the prescription for building community. It's literally the easiest way. There's 101 different ways that you can build community. I'm telling you the easiest and fastest and quickest and most tight-knit way that you can do it is to eat with people, right? You bring something, I bring something, we eat together, we buy food together, we share it together. All of a sudden you feel the belonging. You feel like these are the guys I eat on weekends with, right? That attachment is built. When the attachment is built, I said it a hundred times earlier, for the hundred and one, hundred and first, my English is terrible. For the hundred and first and final time, I will say that our capital and what we have of value as a ummah is not this building, believe it or not. It's what's inside the building. The value here is not the color of the paint, not the color of the carpet. The value is me and all of you, my family, all of your families. The value is our need to belong to the community, the feeling that we have that we must be attached to the masjid. The value is our willingness to go out and invite our friends and family to say, come and be part of the community, right? But fundamentally, that's what I was trying to drive home. The real asset and the real value of, you know, the the masjid or the organization or even whether it's me as an imam or the chairman of the board, what we value and what we think is valuable that we have as an asset, believe you me, is not the building. It's the community that we have. Then the year ahead, inshallah, is going to be dedicated for what? Fiqh. Building the community. And to build the community, first it starts with all of you who are here, that you have to have talking to you guys and the guys who are online because these are the people who I see, right? It starts with you guys first feeling the need. Like, I have a need to belong to the community. Because if you don't need to belong and you don't feel the need to belong, then I can't help you. The board can't help you. The outgoing president can't help you, right? Nobody can help you. You must feel the need. That this is what I want and this is what I need. When you reach that level, inshallah, then I promise you guys on behalf of myself and I'll take the liberty on behalf of the whole organization. I promise you that if you feel the need to belong, we will work together. We will find a way to fulfill our need, inshallah. And there's thousands of ways we can do that, right? We are not a jama'ah or a group of people who are locked with some idea that we have to eat at this time. And we have to come at this time and leave at this time. We're very flexible, very open-minded. We will do whatever works best for everyone, inshallah. Whatever will fulfill our fundamental goal, which is to build community, right? By now, I'm getting tired of repeating building community. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you for your question. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. I will turn over the mic, inshallah, to Rizka and Zoya to share the Quranic recitation and translation. And then we will get ready for Salatul Asr. Barakallahu feekum wa ahsanallahu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Is it my cup? These are these ones now? Yeah. Uh, you can use the other one if you want. Yeah, it's more easy. It's more easy. Let me switch this off. Do me a favor, though, when you're done, you switch that off and you switch this back on for Zoya. Right, watch cool. it, watch it. And make sure you put this on your avai or something. Yes. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Ma kana ala nabiyyi min arajin fi ma faradallahu lah. سنة الله في الذين خلوا من قبل وكان أمر الله قدرا مقدورا الذين يبلغون رسالات الله رسالات الله ويخشونه ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله وكفى بالله حصيبا ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله 
ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء عليما يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا وسبحوا بكرة وأصيلا هو الذي يصلي عليكم وملائكه وملائكته ليخرجكم من الظلمات إلى النور وكان بالمؤمنين رحيما تحيتهم يوم يلقونه السلام وعد لهم أجرا كريما يا أيها النبي إنا أرسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا وبشر المؤمنين بأن لهم من الله فضلا كبيرا ولا تطع الكافرين والمنافقين ودع عذاهم ودع عذاهم وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا صدق الله العظيم Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. There is no blame on the Prophet for doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained, ordained from him. That has been the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with those prophets who had gone before. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command had been firmly decreed. That, it, that is his way with those prophets who deliver the messages of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and consider him and none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sufficient is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a vigilant reckoner. Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon him, is not the father of any of your men, but is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the seal of the prophets. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has perfect knowledge of things. O believers, always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often and glorify him morning and evening. He is the one who showers his blessings upon you and his angels pray for you so that he may bring you out of darkness and into light for he is ever merciful to the believers. Their greeting on the, their greeting on the day they, they meet him will be peace and he has prepared for them an honorable reward. O prophet, we have sent you as a witness and a deliverer of good news and a warner a, and a caller to, to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his command and beacon of light. Give good news to the believers that they will have great bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not yield to the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Overlook their annoyances and put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient as a trustee of affairs.